Welcome back to the Gentleman's Gazette. In today's video, we discuss the formality scale of clothes because you can only ever be well-dressed if you're properly attired for the occasion. So what is appropriate for the occasion is often stipulated by the level of formality of the event. For example, you wear something different when you just go grocery shopping or to the gym than if you go to a garden party, to your office, or to a gala event. So the big question becomes, how do you know if a garment is casual, formal, or somewhere in between? In this video, we cover the general principles of nearly every garment in classic menswear, and we give you general clues so you can get an idea if something is more in a casual end or in a formal end, or simply in the golden middle. Back in the day, this used to be a little easier since formality scales were very strict. In this day and age, everything is more vague and fluid, and so looking at those principles can even help you more to nail your outfit. So without further ado, let's jump right into the general principles, starting with the colors, casual versus formal color schemes. Generally speaking, brighter colors are more casual than darker colors. So for example, a mid-blue suit is less formal than a navy or charcoal suit. Now, a smart tip is to think of colors you would typically see during summer as being more casual, with maybe the exception of beige, blue, and white, because they're appropriate year-round. This concept is based on a long-established distinction between town and country wear, which originated in England. Back then, shades of brown were not worn in town because it was more associated with the rural countryside. Meanwhile, charcoal, gray, or navy blue suits would be worn to conduct proper business in London and even outside of London. Today, the no brown in town rule is no longer relevant because overall the spectrum has more shifted towards the casual end of things and you can wear a pair of brown Oxford shoes in town and to the office in nearly any setting these days. Next up, let's look at texture and how that can define whether something is casual or formal. Overall, the smoother and shinier a fabric is, the more formal it is. For example, a textured basket weave fabric is more likely to be encountered on a casual sport coat or maybe even a casual suit, and a pair of corduroy is typically found in a pair of casual pants, not dress pants. Overall, the more visible and pronounced a weave or a texture is, the more casual the garment is. Along those lines, a tie in a knobby shantung silk, which is a bit more matte, is less formal than a shiny satin silk bow tie in black. So how come shiny fabrics are part of classic menswear? Well, they're considered to be a texture and they're rather smooth, and typically they're found in evening wear. For example, the lapel of a tuxedo typically is faced in shiny silk, and so is the cummerbund. Similarly, velvet is a fabric that has some sheen to it, and it's often used for dinner jackets. If you want to learn more about black tie and white tie in general, check out this guide here, and for dinner jackets specifically, head over here. Along those same lines, shiny patent leather is traditionally used as an evening shoe, either as an Oxford without a cap toe or an opera pump. Next, let's look at how patterns can increase or decrease the level of formality. Generally, garments with patterns, especially bolder ones, are more casual. Traditionally, in British tailoring, any form of houndstooth or plaid used to be something worn in the countryside. Of course, over time, things changed, and by sizing patterns down, such as a Prince of Wales check, and making them more muted, they became appropriate for office wear as well. Another exception to the rules were accessories such as a pocket square or a tie because they could be patterned even in a formal office setting. Traditionally, pocket squares and ties were made out of silk and the fine, shiny texture of silk superseded the pattern that was printed or woven on them. The smaller the pattern, the more formal it becomes. And as such, you can wear a small patterned tie with formal morning wear, such as a morning coat, which is the most formal dress coat during the day. Of course, the size of the pattern also correlates with the color. So a bright window pane is a little more casual than a very subdued window pane, the same size. So how does structure correlate with formality? Well, it's simple. The more structure a garment has, the more formal it is. 
When it comes to tailoring or jackets, there's a term military tailoring, which means you have a very stiff canvas or interlining, which creates a very smooth look without any wrinkles, and that is considered to be very formal and proper. On the flip side, an unlined jacket without any padded shoulders in a linen fabric has no structure or very little structure and is therefore more casual. For classic neckties, it means that something with an unlined tipping where there is no structure is less formal than a tipped tie, which is just a little stiffer. The same is true for shirts or dress shirts. More formal shirts will have a stiffer interlining in the collar and the cuffs to just create a smooth look. On the other hand, a more casual shirt with, let's say, a button-down collar does not have any stiff interlining. It is very soft and more casual. Of course, no one single item defines the formality scale in total. You always have to take into account other things such as color, texture, and fabric weight. Furthermore, the purpose, the origins, and the historic use of a garment can also have an impact on its formality scale. So something originally intended for country wear or for sports or utilitarian wear is more casual than something meant to be worn during the evening. For example, think of a tennis sweater or a pair of shorts, which are both more on the casual spectrum. On the other hand, a three-piece suit is always more on the formal side, even though it may come in a more casual fabric, such as a brown houndstooth, and there are details such as patch pockets, a belt in the back, and a shooting plate. All right, now that you know the general rule, let's move on to specific garments, starting with a jacket. The less structure a jacket has, the less formal it becomes. That's the reason why many men who prefer to wear more structured suits for classic business outfits tend to navigate towards more of a Neapolitan style that is very soft and unstructured for out-of-office wear. Jackets in the Neapolitan style are often completely unpadded and have very little or no structure at all. And they're often favored by men who don't have to wear suits, but who just choose to dress for fun and wear them because it's comfortable for them, but they still enjoy the look of a suit. In terms of fabric, the general rules apply here. A suit or a jacket in a brown linen or maybe a corduroy are more casual than something in a plain worsted weave or very fine twill. Small patterns such as a pinpoint, a shark skin, or a hopsack are a little less formal, but in a navy dark color, they're still perfectly appropriate for a business suit in this day and age. If you were to rank different materials on a formality scale, we'd start with linen at the casual end, followed by cotton and maybe tweeds and flannels. Followed by that, you have worsted wools and fine cashmeres or silk wool blends. To learn more about the difference between flannel and worsted fabric and how they're made differently, please check out this in-depth guide here and there. Also think about wrinkles. Materials such as linen or cotton wrinkle more, they have more texture and are therefore more casual. If you wanna learn more about those materials, check out the guides on our website here. On the flip side, wool is very wrinkle resistant and therefore more formal. Of course, the weight of the fabric also impacts the degree of formality. The heavier and coarser something is, the more casual it is. On the other hand, a super 200s or a very fine thin wool is on the more formal end of a spectrum. Unless, of course, you get it in a purple color that makes it more casual again. In terms of buttoning, double-breasted is traditionally more formal than single-breasted. And because of that, it's traditionally worn with peaked lapels. The more buttons you have in a jacket, the more casual it gets. That's why most dinner jackets have only a single button because it's the most formal version. Business suits have two or three buttons and fashionable suits have more four or five buttons. For double-breasted jackets, four or six buttons are most common, two, eight or more are more uncommon. Another very important feature in terms of formality scale in a jacket are its pockets. Patch pockets, no matter if they have flaps or not, are considered to be the most casual option, followed by flap pockets and having jetted pockets to be the most formal variety. Traditionally, flap pockets were used for country wear because you go horseback riding and a flap would prevent things from falling out of your pocket. On the other hand, jetted pockets, being on a more formal end of the spectrum, are typically found in things like dinner jackets and tuxedos, which is why if you find a tuxedo with flap pockets, you know that it's historically incorrect and you should rather move on and buy something with a pair of jetted pockets. 
Adding additional pockets, such as a ticket pocket, makes things more casual, even though it is still okay in this day and age to wear a three-piece pinstripe suit, which is rather on the formal end, and wearing it with a ticket pocket. The same is true for angled pockets, which are traditionally called hacking pockets, which come from the word hack or hackney, which means saddle. To learn more about the hacking jacket, its origins, and how the pockets got angled, please check out this guide on our website here. Another great way to determine the formality of a jacket is by looking at its lapels. A notched lapel is less formal than a peaked lapel, and a shawl collar is somewhere in between. Because of that, a tuxedo or a dinner jacket will traditionally always have a peaked lapel and never a notched lapel. Maybe sometimes a shawl collar, but notched lapels, no. A variation on the peak lapel is a so-called Touts lapel, which was invented by the Savile Row tailor E. Touts. It's characterized by pointing straight out, but it still looks very much like a peak lapel. A variation on a notch lapel is a so-called Kniche lapel, named after the famous Viennese tailor house Kniche. It looks more like a notch lapel, but it has an angled gorge similar to a peak lapel. Last but not least, the type of vent you choose also has an impact on the formality of the jacket as a whole. Basically, you have three options. No vent, single vent, or side vents. Traditionally, the most casual option is a center vent, which was invented for horseback riding, so you wouldn't expose your rear or your bum. On the other hand, in the 1930s, most suits would have no vents because that would create a very clean-looking silhouette and was considered to be the most formal option. Because of that, even in garments such as a tuxedo, typically have no vents at all. Back then, it would have been improper to stand there with the hands in your pockets, but these days, it's much more normal. And when you do that with a jacket that has no vents, it just looks bad. On the other hand, a jacket with side vents is a little more comfortable. You can still put your hands in your pocket and look good. And overall, they're more formal than a center vent because it doesn't expose your bum. Formality-wise, side vent sits in the middle between the center vent and no vent. But honestly, today, most suits or jackets are made with side vents, and it's a good option. I've even seen tuxedos with side vents. Personally, I'm a purist, and so I prefer no vents on any form of tuxedo or dinner jacket. Now that you know everything about the jacket, let's move on to pants. First, look at the center of the pants. If there's a sharp crease, that means it's a more formal trouser. If it's a flat front without any crease, it's a more casual trouser. Dress pants are usually made out of wool because they really keep a nice crease, versus more casual trousers can be made out of cotton or linen or blends. Typically, if you have a pair of pants with pleats, you get a better crease and they're also a little fuller, and where you should still wear them in this day and age, please check out this video here. More casual pants, such as chinos, are typically made in a thicker cotton fabric, which wrinkles more and doesn't hold a crease as well, and is therefore overall more casual. Also, the more decorative elements you have, such as rivets or contrast stitching, the more casual the garment gets. Just think about a pair of jeans, for example, which is more casual. Adding cuffs to your pants makes them more casual, but I usually like it because it adds an additional weight, which means the trousers drape better. Also, the more pockets you have in a pair of pants, the more casual it gets. Because of that, evening pants oftentimes don't feature any side pockets or back pockets because the idea is that you get a clean line that looks very nice and you are not supposed to use the pockets anyways. On the other hand, a pair of jeans has two pockets in the back, two pockets on the side, and sometimes a little coin pocket on top of that. That makes it more utilitarian and casual. Now, when it comes to shirts, the fabric color alone doesn't really determine the level of formality. It's also things like the texture and the weave of the shirt, as well as the pockets, the cuffs, and the collar. On top of that, you have details such as stitching and the contrast. For example, look at the Oxford cloth button-down shirt. It's typically made in a thicker fabric. It has a two-tone texture, which is more casual. It has a pocket on the chest. It features barrel cuffs and a button-down collar, which are both soft. And overall, it's a more casual shirt that is typically more worn with a sport coat or on its own, not with a three-piece business suit. To learn more about the so-called OCBD, please check out this guide here. If you want to move up a notch in formality, go with pinpoint shirt fabrics or broadcloth. Since they represent a middle ground that can be worn with more casual outfits, but also with business suits. 
More elevated shirt fabrics are typically the ones with more sheen in a finer weave with a higher spun cotton. In terms of patterns, you can apply the general rules. The bigger the pattern is and the more colorful, the more casual it is. The smaller or non-existent the pattern is and the more muted the colors are, the more formal it gets. That being said, evening shirts are the most formal ones and they typically have a pleated insert or Marcella bib and that's just considered to be the special uniqueness of an evening outfit. Likewise, starching a shirt makes it stiffer and more structured and because of that also more formal. Of course, starching a white tie shirt is just natural. On the other hand, starching a linen or a madras shirt doesn't make it more formal because the pattern is just too bold. As I mentioned before, a softer collar is more casual than a more structured collar with a stiffer interlining. Also, any buttons on the collar make it more casual. In terms of collar shapes, the semi-spread or spread collar or classic collar are kind of in the middle. Next up is a tab collar. For an even more formal style, go with a wing collar. Traditionally, those were detachable collars that could just put on any shirt. In this day and age, it's much more common to have collars that are sewn onto the shirt. Because detachable collars are often much stiffer and sometimes also polished and shinier, they're always more formal than the same shape in an attached collar version. For a much more extensive guide to dress shirt collars, please check out this guide here. Finally, the last and probably one of the most easiest way to determine the formality of a shirt is by looking at its cuffs. Essentially, the ones with a button cuff, also known as barrel cuff, are on the casual end. Next up, you have the French cuff or double cuff, which is folded over and worn with cufflinks. Now, the most formal cuffs are stiff, starched single cuffs that are worn with cufflinks. You can see there's a pattern here. As soon as you add something softer, it gets more casual. If it has more starch and more structure, it is more formal. But for tailored jackets, pants, and suits, wool has reigned supreme. When it comes to tie fabrics and neckwear, silk is undoubtedly the number one. However, not all silks are created equal on a formality scale. Again, the shinier and smoother the silk is, the more formal it is. Because of that, shantung silk or tassa silk, which is more matte and more textured and coarser, sometimes with some knobs, is considered to be less formal. And our job in terms of formality are knitted silks or grenadine silks with have more texture and a bit more sheen and regularity than a shantung silk, but still less than, let's say, a satin. Because of that, grenadine and knit ties are very popular these days because they can be worn for business. They're traditional silk ties. At the same time, they have more texture and make things a bit more casual than a traditional business tie. In recent years, silk has often been blended with things like linen or wool to create a softer look that is more in line with the casualization of menswear, even on the classic scale of things. That being said, silk is sometimes skipped altogether for neckwear these days, and that's okay. It's fun to play with silk and without it, and because of that, it pays to have a range of different silk ties, so you can just play and dress up whatever jacket or suit you have, or dress it down in terms of formality. Of course, the patterns of neckwear also influence its formality. A bolder, more lively pattern, let's say a paisley pattern, is considered to be less formal. A stripe is somewhere in the middle, and solids are more formal. Again, just like with suits, the smaller the pattern, the more formal the neckwear. When it comes to men's shoes, obviously, the most casual thing is a pair of sneakers. That is followed by boat shoes and then loafers. Next up is a pair of Derby shoes, which was originally designed for country wear, and it's a better choice for people with bigger feet because it's more flexible in tying your shoes. If you wanna take it a notch up, you wear a pair of monk straps, and these days, double monk straps are also really popular. They're somewhat in the same realm. With that being said, I think the double monk is slightly more casual than the single monk. Now, proper dress shoes are typically Oxfords, which have a close lacing system, and to learn how you can distinguish between Derby's, Oxfords, and a Bloucher, for example, please check out this video here. If you go back 150 years ago, men would wear fine Balmoral or button boots with their very formal frock coats. Now, in this day and age, you can still wear Balmoral boots and button boots, and they're still considered to be very formal, but most people would wear a pair of 
Oxfords when it calls for the most formal footwear. When it comes to shoe colors, black is of course the most formal and brown is less formal and more casual. Colors like gray or olive green are considered to be more casual. Darker colors such as maybe navy or burgundy red are also considered to be somewhat more formal. Of course, the shine and texture principles apply here too. Suede leather or nubuk are very casual. A general box calf leather that is unpolished is more casual than box calf leather that is polished to a mirror shine. And last but not least, patent leather is considered to be the most formal texture. Why? Because it has the brightest shine of all of them. Of course, ornamentation and structure influence the formality of a shoe as well. So the more decoration, ornamentation, and brooging you have, the more casual a shoe gets. Because of that, a cap toe Oxford is more formal than a quarter brook, which has a bit of ornamentation along the cap toe, which is more formal than a semi brook, which has more ornamentation, which is more formal than a full brook, which has sometimes a wingtip and a lot of ornamentation. So now that you pretty much know all the general rules, as well as individual garments and what makes them more formal and less formal, how do you put it all together? Traditionally speaking, the best outfits were those that combined the same level of formality throughout their outfit. That means they would wear a broadcloth shirt with maybe a sport coat and a pair of Derby shoes because it shows the middle level of formality for everything. In this day and age, things have changed a little bit and people have started combining different levels of formality throughout their outfit. For example, a double-breasted jacket always used to be more formal than a single-breasted jacket. And because of that, it always had peak lapels and single-breasted jackets often had notched lapels. Because of that, you'd also rarely find a peak lapel jacket that was double-breasted with patch pockets. And typically, double-breasted jackets were made in fine worsted fabrics and nothing casual. For example, look at Ralph Lauren, who is probably one of the most influential designers in menswear today. He wears a dinner jacket with a pair of denim jeans and cowboy boots, which is not something you would ever put together in a traditional menswear outfit, and it's not something I would ever wear, but for him, it kind of works, and of course, he's a designer, and he has to make a bolder statement. Also, the more formal an outfit gets, the more important it is that you stick with the same units of formality. For example, if you wear a three-piece pinstripe suit in a dark navy, go with a finer shirt collar, go with a silk tie, and don't combine it with a pair of boat shoes, but instead with a pair of dark Oxfords. The same is true for black tie, white tie, and evening wear in general. You wanna stick more to the traditional classic rules and don't just start wearing a purple shirt, but a white shirt, because that's how the outfit is well put together and it just looks a lot better. Of course, if you're really confident in the way you dress, you can maybe experiment with a green or burgundy dinner jacket to just mix things up and underline your personal level of style. On the flip side, on a more casual end, you can just try to mix things up more and combine different levels of formality throughout your outfit much more easily. My outfit in today's video is a great example of that. My jacket is made out of a linen fabric in a classic Prince of Wales pattern that has elements of turquoise green, blue, and gray, which is very summery. It also has a lot of texture. Then it features peak lapels, which were traditionally more formal, but it has informal patch pockets and informal white buttons. It has a bit of structure and some lining in the sleeves, but the back is unlined. I'm combining it with a shirt made out of a more casual denim fabric. It has barrel cuffs, which makes it a little casual, but a collar that could be also worn with a three-piece suit if the shirt was white. I did skip the neckwear altogether, which makes it more casual, but I'm wearing a silk pocket square, which makes it more formal, and a boutonniere, which adds a touch of color and is definitely a more stylish detail that earns you compliments guaranteed. You can find both of them in our Fort Belvedere shop here. My pants are a classic pair of cotton chinos and the crease has come out and you see a bit of wrinkling, so it works well with my jacket. 
My shoes are a pair of Derby shoes in a dark brown, which provide enough contrast, so they're visually interesting, but I make them a bit more casual by adding a contrasting pair of shoelaces. Shoelaces are a great way to change the look and the formality of your shoes simply by changing a small detail that is very inexpensive. To learn more about shoelaces and how you can combine them to your advantage, please check out these guides here. The socks I'm wearing are shadow strap socks from Fort Belvedere, which are over the calf in light gray and blue, which pick up the color of my jacket, but provide enough contrast between the shoes and my pants to make it all work together. My pinky ring in white gold with a star sapphire picks up the lighter color scheme of the outfit and my belt from Fort Belvedere picks up that silver tone from the ring and combines it with the color of the shoes in a dark chocolate brown. It's part of the belt system that allows you to combine any belt with any buckle, but it looks like a proper belt every time. To learn more about it, head over here.